Hello, viewers. Welcome to another edition of CHP Talks. I'm here today with CHP leader Rod Taylor and our special guest, Jojo Ruba. We're looking forward to talking again, revisiting the, the issue of the conversion therapy ban in Calgary. A lot has happened since we talked about it last time, so let's get into it. Rod, do you want to introduce our special guest? Sure. Well, it's a real pleasure to have Jojo Ruba with us today. Uh, Jojo is the executive director of Faith Beyond Belief. And he'll be talking about that a little bit as well. <clears throat> uh, he is a youth coordinator at his church, and he's a co-founder of uh, CCBR, Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform, and that's uh, a great organization as well. So, uh, Jojo, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here, Rod. I uh, remember the first time I met Jojo was about eight or nine years ago when he came to northern British Columbia to the Bulkley Valley and spoke to our uh, annual spring fundraising dinner for the Smithers Pro-Life Society. And that was uh, a great uh, a great time, gave a good speech. And, and so we know you've been busy ever since trying to make this country a better place to live. So thanks. Thank uh, you. No, I remember that trip. Uh, I it was the first time I've ever had bear meat, I think it was. So that was really... <laughs> It's, it's on my memory banks for sure. Yeah, well, very good. I'm, I'm glad you had that experience. So uh, there's still a few wandering around here if you want to come back. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. So we, we mentioned Faith Beyond Belief. George, do you want to give us a sense as to why that started and how you got involved? Well, Peter, yeah, I... I uh, was part of CCBR. I'm still very proud of the work that was done there, and I'm very glad for the pro-life apologetics that uh, that organization provides from a very uh, smart, uh, logical, secular perspective that a secular audience can understand. But the success of that organization showed me me and show me some other people as well that we needed that same kind of smart thinking and worldview training on all the other issues but from a christian perspective so we took a lot of the lessons we learned from ccbr put it towards faith beyond belief and said look we need to be able to defend just as we smartly as we do on abortion all the other issues that are we're being under attack like the existence of god or can we trust the bible or on this one we're talking about today what is the biblical view of sexuality and gender and how can we help the culture understand that the biblical view is both true and good. It's, it's good for human flourishing. So that's why we started Faith Beyond Belief about eight years ago. Excellent. Well, that, that really puts it into a nutshell. And, and so you're involved in, in co-founding uh, CCBR and Faith Beyond Belief. Right. I'm, on the, I'm the founder of Faith Beyond Belief, along with a few of my friends. Wow. Great. And uh, so how did, how did that... Um, develop in terms of, of your life, your journey? Well, one of the, the key things growing up in the church, I'm a pastor's kid, was to always understand that to the biblical worldview makes sense. It's, it's something worth believing in. I remember when I was in my first year university, I, and for just a brief, maybe millisecond or so, I remember ha having moved away from home to go to university, that I didn't actually have to go keep going to church. And if I stopped going to church because I moved to a new town, no one knew who I was, no one would know. Uh, but I joined a Christian organization on campus, and uh, I met on the first week there a friend who's still a friend today, a young man who grew up in a non-Christian home. And he actually came to Christ after being a, logically thinking through. He was actually a computer scientist. That's, he's, that's what he still is, actually. And he started looking at different worldviews. And computer scientists, as you know, uh, when they look at code, they have to study every aspect of the code to see which part isn't working or which part needs to be fixed. Well, that's what he did with worldviews. He looked at Islam and Mormonism and realized only Christianity made the most sense with logic, with philosophy, with science, with biology, with uh, all kinds of uh, aspects of knowledge. And that's why he became a Christian. And that really challenged me to understand uh, if I was a Christian because my parents were Christians or because Christianity is true. And that's what really brought me to do the work I'm doing now and also help to bring that kind of thinking to the work we did at CCBR. Okay, so let's bring that around then to the, the main issue that we're talking about today. 
um, the conversion therapy ban in Calgary. And um, maybe we can just take a couple steps back if someone's watching who doesn't uh, have any concept of what's happened. Um, just maybe a little bit of a lead up and then where things are at today. Well, yeah, so uh, we've been seeing across Alberta uh, conversion therapy bans being passed by municipal governments of all things. And it's through a man named Dr. Christopher Wells, who's a professor researcher at the Grant McEwen University, a very controversial figure among many other things, but he is an LGBT activist who's been pushing the provincial government on, to do all kinds of things, uh, supporting uh, a worldview that I think is completely anti-biblical. So for example, he actually was pushing the NDP government to force Christian schools, including many reform schools, to implement gay straight alliance clubs, claiming that was the only way to protect gay children. And uh, he would force these clubs onto Christian schools, but they were not anti-bullying clubs. For the most part, many of the clubs were political, were indoctrinating kids. Uh, we know at one school, they actually had a gay pastor telling the students at a secular school of the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. In the same group, they also had political activists proclaiming that anyone who disagreed with their political view hated gay people and wanted them harmed. And, and that's why I think it's so important to understand the heart of this man and what he's doing. So he started pushing these uh, conversion therapy bans across the province. And conversion therapy is how they define is uh, any kind of attempts to try to change someone's sexual orientation or sexual behavior from gay or non-heterosexual to straight. And what's, what's, what's frustrating is as he's pushing these bans, he's claiming all of these victims of churches that had uh, experienced conversion therapy by force, by coercion. But if you actually look at the wording of almost every, I think every ban that's been passed in Alberta, they're worded so broadly that it actually attacks any kind of perspective that says homosexual or tr transgender ideology, the belief system and the practice, not the people, the practice are sinful. That's actually covered now under these bans. And so Calgary has passed the worst conversion therapy ban in the continent uh, as of this week that actually um, puts, into, put the, puts this law into practice, puts people in jail who don't pay a $10,000 fine if, the, if they're caught uh, offering non-judgmental, -jud that's the term they used, judgmental counseling, teaching, or preaching from the Bible. And it was very uh, deceitfully passed, if I could say it that way, because they kept proclaiming that religious practices are still going to be protected, but then they defined religion as merely reading the Bible or practicing it within the four walls of your church or home, and not about teaching or sharing your worldview to other people. As far as a strategy, this reminds me of how uh, same-sex marriage came to, to be in this country, came to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, voted in in Parliament and began in the 90s, and it was through uh, court cases. You know, progressively uh, uh, pushing the issue through court cases in various provinces. And by the time in 2005, when the uh, Liberal government at the time passed uh, same-sex marriage, and barely just by uh, basically because of a forced vote, <laughs> they forced their members to vote for it, and and passed it, um, it had already been sort of pushed in the public domain for so long through the courts. And so I think that's probably part of Mr. Wells' strategy is, uh, you know, break it down in various communities, focus on a community. And uh, of course, uh, we know that Justin Trudeau and uh, Justice Minister David Lametti are preparing Bill C-8, or Bill C-8 has already uh, had been tabled and that would, and also S202 in the Senate that would uh, accomplish the same thing on a nationwide basis. They're basically letting uh, Chris Wells and those uh, involved in that type of organization to do their uh, dirty work for them and to break down local resistance. And it's- Well, uh, the, the, the federal ban, uh, Rod, that, that's being discussed is actually based on Christopher Wells' bylaws that he helped write in Edmonton. And one of the Liberal MPs before he got defeated from Edmonton uh, actually spoke to the city council in Edmonton. I was actually there. So I, I saw this and he discussed openly how 
uh, they were wanting to pass the very same kind of bylaw that they've been passing here in Alberta to in the federal lane. So every part of the country would be affected by this. Yeah. And, and the federal law is a little different than the Alberta one in the sense that they realize they can't stop consenting adults to have conversations, which the city of Calgary apparently doesn't understand. They voted down several amendments allowing for consenting adults to have conversations, private conversations with counselors or pastors. Uh, they vote, and only two two counselors voted for consenting adults to do that. Uh, but the uh, the federal government uh, took uh, at least recognizes that by not mentioning it. But it's not it doesn't make it any far or any worse. Uh, it, advertising, uh, sharing, and advertising can include, according to the the municipality uh, here, the lawyers here, uh, said advertising can be even word of mouth. So if you're a pastor, you're preaching and you say, I'm gonna do counseling for people who struggle with same-sex attraction or transgender identity to help them live a biblical worldview when it comes to sexuality, uh, that would be considered conversion therapy advertising, which would be banned in the federal law. But the federal law is worse because it actually pr criminalizes potentially, and it really is criminal, conversations between a child and her parents. So if a, a child as young as five or six wants to become a boy and she's a girl biologically, the parents can only provide affirming counseling, which means they can only agree with her idea that she should be a boy. Mm -hmm. and, and any kind of counseling against that would not be allowed, would be, actually be criminal. And what happened in Toronto, there was one of the world-class clinics based in Toronto that actually had 80 to 90% success rate helping children as young as five or six adopt and accept their biological bodies and realizing there is just confusion uh, at that age. Uh, that clinic got shut down because of the, con con the conversion therapy ban passed by the, con the Wynn government. Uh, it, the Liberal government has not been re revoked. And that means any parent who has a child who's struggling with this will no longer be allowed to access any kind of professional help. Uh, let me just tell you one, one quick story I heard from that uh, clinic. Uh, there was a little boy, maybe two or three years old, uh, who wanted to become a girl, and uh, maybe a little older, maybe four or five, and he wanted to become a girl when his sister was born. And they did everything they can to figure out why his little boy wanted to be a girl, and they realized because when his sister was born, she was actually uh, unhealthy. She had all kinds of health issues and was constantly in the hospital. Everyone doted on her, everyone took, look, looked at her, paid attention to her. And this little four-year-old boy wanted that attention. And so he thought the only way to get that attention was to become a girl. Oh. And, and so finally, through good counseling, through uh, a lot of help and support from the parents, the little boy realized he didn't have to change his gender in order to become someone loved and accepted by the family. Again, with the criminal law, and it's jail time here we're talking about, is passed by the federal government, those parents would be criminals under that law. Well, and there's no, this law does not in any way apply, as I understand it, to those who are leading young children into a lifestyle contrary or, you know, inconsistent with their biological gender, uh, you know, even in schools, school counselors, uh, mm -hmm. Gay Straight Alliance clubs, wh whatever uh, influence there, there may be out there. Um, yeah, no, Rod, yeah. this is the issue here. We, we're dealing with worldviews, really, and that's at the heart of, of our ministry. I know that's what the heart of what you guys are offering as well. But the worldview that says truth is objective, that we have to start with an objective understanding of reality. It doesn't matter how we feel about that reality. In fact, facts or truth should shape our feelings. In this situation, we have the opposite worldview. We have feelings that shape facts. Wow. Mm. And now we have a situation where how people feel is not only uh, something that determines reality, it's codified in law. We have to accept how people feel and not offend them and offending them itself would be a crime. I mean, in, in Calgary, uh, like I said, the term they're using to justify this bylaw is you're still allowed to do counseling, you're still allowed to do preaching, as long as it's non-judgmental and accepting. Well, what does that even mean? Do, uh, are we not allowed to judge someone's behavior or ideas or ideology? Or are we judging a person? Right? Because by even stating that, this is what the, the silliest thing I heard from one of the counselors. She said, those people are so judgmental, you shouldn't be judging people. Well, when she said that, of course, that itself is what? 
a judgment. judgment. <laughs> exactly. And she has no mindset at all of what she's doing. So this counselor, even when they voted for this bylaw, she said, I'm a Sikh, a Sikh. And as a Sikh, I am. I'm, I'm teaching my, my beliefs. I am a religious person. I'm proud of that. And it's wrong to convert people from their religious perspectives. So th that's the heart of what we're dealing with. Because if it's, wow. religion is merely just your feeling, your cultural worldview, it's your preference, then yeah, it's like asking me to, to change my preference for uh, you know, milk chocolate versus dark chocolate versus white chocolate, right? Everyone has their preference. But if we're talking about facts, whether Jesus died or whether he rose again, or whether there's an objective male and female, there's DNA, right? Those are things that, in my opinions, do not change. In fact, those facts should change my opinions. And we're the reverse course right now in Canada. Yeah. One, one thing that uh, puzzles me wow. uh, goes, uh, uh, in various towns is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how so many city councilors have been, you know, just swept up in this uh, dialogue and, and have just accepted the point of view of Mr. Wells. Uh, you know, what do you think is behind that? Why, why are, uh, you know, people who have been elected, you know, they're, they're not uh, dumb people, uh, you know, they're in, intelligent people, and, uh, and yet they seem to jump on board with this thing and, and they run with it. Why is that? Well, I mean, to be fair, the LGBT activists, and I want to differentiate between gay people. There's a lot of struggling people who don't understand why they're sexually attracted one way or the other. There's a lot of confused young people. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the activists, the people who are making all kinds of radical claims that the only way to love LGBT people is to agree with everything they say and do. I don't think anyone in their right mind, whether you're gay or not, will say that makes that makes no sense, right? That, that's something that they would say that, that is not fair. That's not how democracy works. But they've been working for many, many years to get this on their agenda. There was a book written by two communications experts in the 1980s, all the way back then, and they're, they're public relations guys, two gay, act, gay activists, and they actually lay out a plan on how to get the communities that they lived in to accept LGBT identity. And they basically, if you read the book, it actually follows, they, they followed that trajectory almost to the T. Wow. It's called After the Ball is what the book is called. I can send you the references later on. But, uh, but the other part of that is the church has really dropped the ball, speaking of the ball, uh, on this issue because we have, we have not talked about sexuality or gender from a biblical perspective to our own people, let alone to the culture around us. So we haven't done a good job presenting not only the truthfulness of the biblical view of sexuality, but the goodness of the biblical view of sexuality. And what, why these ideas are being accepted so readily is because they don't see any rational reason or, or, or argument for why sex should be safe for her husband and wife, and they don't see it as a good thing. If you're, you're looking at these tortured souls who claim that churches are torturing gay children in each of our basements, right? That's basically the argument that we heard. Um, then, and, and then the, on the other side, we're trying to say, well, the Bible says this, uh, who, who is the secular culture going to listen to? Uh, there, there's a complete disconnect. Uh, let me give you a little illustration quickly. I was at Fort Mac. I've been at several city councils now speaking against these conversion therapy bans across Alberta. And at Fort McMurray, we showed up, my, my friend and I from Edmonton showed up to speak at city council. There was no Christian representative from the whole municipality who showed up, except right. one uh, fundamentalist Baptist pastor who was our driver. And he wasn't even going to speak to council except for the fact that he was our driver, he showed up, realized he could still add his name to, to the list, and he was the only local guy who spoke out of all the thousands of Christians in that area. Not only that, the Christian Ministerium in Fort McMurray, uh, we contacted them to see if they would show up. And this, this, this old Baptist pastor was friends with a lot of them. But the, the, the person in charge of the Ministerium, even though she was sympathetic, said they could not even pass on the email to invite pastors from that Ministerium to speak out against the bylaw because the Ministerium itself was divided over this issue. There had been so many churches compromised on the issue, they could not speak with one voice. Wow. And when, then when we went to city council to speak, 
I, I, uh, I saw this pastor speak, and, and praise God for him. I'm so glad he was there. But the city councilors reacted. They, they were so livid with his words about the Bible, his quoting of scripture. In fact, one city councilor actually said, your Bible is 2,000 years old. Maybe it's time for you to change it. And another Catholic school, former Catholic school board trustee, was so angry because what she perceived his comments about reading from the Bible as judgmental and hateful against LGBT people. And then the mayor proclaimed that we have to protect the victims, not the people providing the counseling, even though the argument we gave was the people who are needing the counseling, Christians and others who are struggling with this issue or looking uh, for, for help from the church will no longer be allowed to get this counseling. And the worst part of it is the mayor of Fort McMurray is, goes to a local Christian, evangelical Christian church. And I have to tell you, I'm not sure if the local pastor there has ever once preached on this issue, showing grace and truth on it. So how can we not expect that this is going to happen if we don't not only train our people why the biblical view is true, but then train them to explain to the secular people why the biblical view is good? And neither of those things have happened in any kind of large scale. Well, in the political realm, of course, CHP has been trying to um, show those basic things, right? Show why Christian mm -hmm. principles apply to politics and why they're good for the country um, in, from everything from finance to um, the topic that we're on today, sexual morality. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'll just um, put that in there. And then I'm, I guess I'm wondering in terms of going forward, um, is there any thought towards um, challenging the constitutionality of this conversion therapy ban? I mean, it seems like it's a, a direct threat to our charter um, right to freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of association, maybe. Um, any any yeah, well, plans on that? Quite a few things, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't give away all of these plans yet because we know we're being monitored by the other side. And hello, people from the other side. But uh, what we want to be able to say is, look, at the end of the day, uh, this debate is not is not over. There, one of the things the media ignored when they were covering this co this issue, and that's the same thing that's happening on, on every media scale. Uh, you're, I don't know if your your uh, listeners will know. I actually have a journalism degree from Carleton University in the middle of Ottawa, so I, I know how that culture works. I lived there, I studied there, I, I know many of the the players. But the move that they have had is they want to ignore us altogether, so they don't want to cover the issue fairly. They don't have to anymore because we haven't spoken up. And the way, best way to uh, make sure this happens is they completely ignore us altogether. Uh, and, and so our perspective is never actually covered. Even when you have issues like this, where the issue is the people who are raising their concern, that's not even covered. So when the, uh, the city council had public hearings on this bylaw, they broke records on the number of oral submissions that uh, were received. 121 people came to speak. They had to extend it for a second day. They have over, I think, 1,200, 1,500 pages now worth of written submissions from people all over the world. And what actually happened was our side, I organized, and we had about 300 written submissions, about 60 people presenting on our side. And when the other side heard about this, they started organizing their people. In fact, the city, uh, from what I understand, extended the, the limit for allowing people to submit their ideas and questions so that they could counter ours. And I, I'm raising that to say that this, this is not over yet because there's a lot of people in Calgary very much concerned and upset about exactly what you said, Peter. This violates all kinds of charter rights. Right. And we are ready to fight that uh, in the appropriate venues. Let's just say it that way. Yes, exactly. Uh, CHP actually had a court case where our freedom of speech and of political um, expression uh, was challenged by the city of Hamilton and uh, that court case we won and the judge severely reprimanded the city of Hamilton for limiting the right of a political party to make a political statement. So I hope that uh, we get a common sense judge if that's the way it goes. If not, um, whatever venue avenue you're pushing, uh, God's blessing and uh, strength for that battle. Thank you.
No, we're, we're so uh, pleased to have uh, allies in the trenches and you are in the front lines there. And uh, Calgary somehow has been thrust into the center of the uh, debate here and, and the good people in Calgary that, that care about these issues. They are, you know, forerunners across the country. We're, we're all going to have to take this on. It's not, not a, just a Calgary issue, but thank you to those in Calgary who are standing up on the issue. Absolutely. Well, can I just say one thing about that? Because the people in Calgary have been amazing. We've had huge churches, which are never political, sending out letters to their congregation, asking them to write their city councilor to, to, to explain to them how severe this bylaw actually is, where the, the city lawyer actually said this can affect public speakers at a sermon, at a church, preaching from the Bible. Right? And, 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 and so, of course, we need to be very very concerned. But I would also say the reason why God has planted this, uh, this challenge for us here is because we are ready. We have been working many years as Faith Beyond Belief to provide apologetics training to the church, including people bringing people in like Walt Heyer, a former transgender, and Sam Malberry, a Christian speaker from Ravi Zacharias Ministries, who himself struggles with same-sex attraction. And they were some of the best received speakers here in Alberta when we brought them here. And because we've been doing that work along with alongside ministries like Journey Canada that provides uh, support for people struggling with same-sex attraction, we've been able to uh, create a catalyst of individuals here who are well-trained, who know the issues, who realize we're not the bad guys. We actually are providing a great service for the kingdom and for the secular culture. Right? We have LGBT people coming to us seeking that support, even if they're not always Christians. Uh, and that's the reason why I think it was such a groundswell of support, because we did the job of educating and providing the tools for people to, to engage wisely and well. And if your community is not ready for that, then it will be like all the other communities that just rolled over. Uh, we have friends in Edmonton who said, we didn't even know this bylaw passed, and who didn't react to it. Literally, I think 10 people showed up. Uh, half of them were not from Edmonton to speak at city council in Edmonton. So we're, we're looking at a situation here where if you're not prepared now or preparing now, this, these kinds of bylaws and worse will pass in your municipality. You know, is there any question? I, we know the constitutionality of the whole ruling is, <clears throat> is in question and, and the federal bill coming will, will face that challenge. But does a municipality even have this kind of, uh, is that within their jurisdiction even to think about these things? I know they've addressed it as a business issue, but that's yep. really a, a red herring, isn't it? Well, it's funny because both the, uh, even the mayor as well as many of the city councilors admitted that this is extra jurisdictional what they're doing. Wow. The municipal, and they did this publicly in the public debate, so I'm not mischaracterizing anything they said. These are the words they actually said. We know this is not part of our jurisdiction. Wow. So they were passing it because they want to stop evil criminal acts that are happening in the churches. Well, torture, coercion, uh, you know, uh, uh, kidnapping, all of those things are already criminal acts in the criminal code of Canada. So the question is, why are you, why do you need to pass a law that is already a part of the federal criminal code, right? And, and really all they said is it's basically virtue signaling. They're trying to pass a symbolic law, and they've added these other things, saying, oh, we're going to throw you in jail if you don't pay, $10,000 fine. Look, the $10,000 fine applies to both the speaker, the audience, and even the venue hosting it. Oh. So the, during the, uh, the debate at city council, they were discussing that a pe two people having a conversation and if it's, con it's, it's deemed as conversion therapy at a coffee shop, the coffee shop owner himself would be liable for that conversation. This and, is and, and, really wild. And, and the, uh, the, like, oh, that's going to be really hard to prove, but don't worry, so we're not really going to enforce it but it's still the law, <laughs> that's, the, that's the point. That's what we're dealing with here. Well, I was told uh, when same-sex marriage was passed, I was told by our NDP member of parliament that don't worry, it won't affect the churches. Well, of course it has, and it continues to affect the churches and marriage commissioners have been fired and so on and so forth. Uh, but th there is 
um, I think we recognize the concept of sphere sovereignty or mm -hmm. jurisdiction, as you mentioned. We've got federal, municipal, provincial, but there's also the jurisdiction and the, the sphere of the church, which is uh, commissioned by God to teach, you know, uh, biblical reality. And parents have the jurisdiction and responsibility f to protect their children from harm. So, uh, you know, municipality of Calgary has unwittingly, you know, uh, stepped on both of those big time. Uh, well, I hope it was unwittingly, because if they're doing it on purpose, they're even more guilty. But uh, we, we need to stand up together as people across this country and resist this uh, move by Justin Trudeau and his justice minister to enforce such a thing uh, nationwide. Well, I, I could just say, here's one thing that CHP can do very well and advocate for. When I was in political science class, when I was doing my journalism degree, one of the, the first concepts we learned was this concept called the common good. And we've really forgotten what that means. The common good means that we don't want to create a Christian society in the sense we force people to become Christians through the law. I mean, as Christians, we don't believe anyone can be forced to become Christians anyway. So I wouldn't believe any kind of that kind of law. Uh, what we're talking about is that there's there's a sense that there's something that we can unify around that benefits everybody. Things like freedom of speech, freedom of, of expression, uh, freedom of conscience. Uh, these things protect democracy. And as we've seen the erosion of those uh, beliefs and, and freedoms, uh, we need people like yourself, like the party, to be able to speak out to say, actually, we want to create a common good again that unites all of us. What's happening now in Ottawa is we have a situation where people who disagree with the current government are being punished based simply on their belief system. So one of the points that, uh, that uh, was made uh, by the Liberal MP and by Chris Wells on a radio show in Edmondson was that any church organization or any kind of religious body that supports what they deem as conversion therapy would also lose their charitable status just because of their belief system. And they used the summer student grants fiasco, if I could use that phrase, uh, to justify this. So they're going after, they're using now this, this policy, a witch hunt, on anyone who believes the traditional or what I call the redemptive view of sexuality that's found in the Bible to say you will lose your charitable status because if you host, hold, hold this view, you are, con you are condoning torture of gay people because simply disagreeing with people's same-sex sexual behavior is deemed, according to this bylaw, if you want to reduce non-heterosexual uh, behavior, it says, you are doing conversion therapy. So if you pray for someone, if you talk to someone and discourage same-sex sexual behavior, as a youth pastor, if one of the girls in my group said, I want to sleep with my boyfriend, and she's 16, I can say, well, no, the Bible doesn't allow you to do that. You have to save yourself from marriage. But if that same girl wants to sleep with another girl, now this bylaw intervenes and tells me I cannot discourage same-sex or non-heterosexual sexual behavior. Wow. Right? That, that's what we're talking about here. So the idea of common good is something that we need to restore back into the public policy realm. And I'd encourage you as a leader, as, a, as people who, in the community, to fight for that. Because we are actually, and this has always been true, the biblical worldview is what, what upholds democracy. It's all the principles that we bring into it saying, you know, we don't have to be in charge, but these are goals that we all will benefit from, whether you're a Christian or not. And as we're taking away these rights, the right to life, the right to freedom of expression, the right to association, everyone's rights will disappear. And that has to be articulated in the political sphere. Yeah. And as we've lost some of those other... Uh, elements of common good we've also been losing elements of democracy at the same time we can exactly. just look at events this week and see you know parliament shut down for the foreseeable future almost um you know these are very real outworkings of the damage that's been done below the surface yeah absolutely and if you think about it much of this is based on someone people who want to do good but the focus is actually helping people feel good not actually mm -hmm. be good and, and without getting into two political issues, but uh, just think about the gun ban that the Liberal government passed. They're banning guns that were not actually used by the mass murderer in Nova Scotia, who had his firearm illegally anyway. 
But when Trudeau was challenged about that, why are you banning guns that were not even, you know, used in this, this bylaw? He basically said, well, we want to keep people safe. But really the line is we want to keep people feeling safe, mm -hmm. not actually being safe. Yeah. And if we could take that basic principle to what's happening here, it's people are wanting to feel safe by not hearing differing opinions. And that will destroy democracy. Yes. So Jojo, it's been such a tremendous uh, privilege to have you with us today. Can you uh, give the the audience uh, a way of contacting you with your email or your website? Sure. Rob, thank you. I really appreciate that. So our ministry is called Faith Beyond Belief, and our website is faithbeyondbelief.ca faithbeyondbelief.ca. And if I could just make one plug, not only do we come and speak, we can come and speak at your church or your organization. We actually have a project geared towards young people called the Identity Project. You can also find that at identityproject.ca that will help you present a biblical view of sexuality and gender to young people, but even also your church board. And one of the key lines we want to teach there is at the end of the day, you may not be able to choose your sexual attractions, but you can choose your identity and that Christ offers us the best identity. So identityproject.ca or faithbeyondbelief.ca. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Rod, did you have any final thought that you wanted to share? Well, you know, it's such a big topic. Um, the world is trying to um, change laws, change the times and seasons. They, they want to reverse a lot of things that, uh, you know, that God has set in place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, our, our role as Christians in this age, we're salt and light in, in our communities. And uh, we see a lot of darkness out there, a lot of confusion um, in the media, uh, the courts, and uh, in the halls of parliament. And we, we just want to be salt and light. We want to present truth. We want to continue to represent and protect the rights of individuals uh, to follow uh, the leading that God has for them and for people to obey their own conscience uh, because if we lose the ability for uh, you know freedom for people to speak and to uh, raise their children according to their own beliefs uh, our country will be descending into a, <clears throat> a strange combination of anarchy and tyranny and we, we wish for the common good as you say uh, Jojo that we can help our society find solid ground again. We believe that is in a biblical worldview. So again, thanks for being with us today. Glad to be here. Yes. Thanks again to both of you for your thoughts and thank you all who are watching. Uh, it's been a very thought provoking session and uh, we hope that you'll join us again for another edition of CHP Talks in the future. God bless you. Thank you.